Our theme this afternoon is the sin of partiality. The sin of partiality. Some of the messages that are coming out of our study in the book of James bear some weight on us. They're not sort of glory, hallelujah, run around and shout messages. But we're on this journey because we want God to speak to our hearts. So these messages are not for your neighbor. Do you know who the message is for? It's for you. It's for me. So as we are sharing the word, if you feel a bit uncomfortable, that's a good sign. It means that you're spiritually alive. (laughs) If you feel a bit of a pinch as the word is being shared, that's a good sign. I'd be more concerned if the word is just coming in one ear, going out the other, and there's no conviction there. That may be an indication that you're spiritually dead. So it's a good thing if you feel a bit uncomfortable in God's house. Is that okay? Amen. The book of James, as was said earlier, that uh, when I began this series, contrasts one thing against another, deals with true faith and compares it to false faith. Authentic faith. Or a veneer of faith. You know what a veneer is, don't you? If you think of, let's say, uh, an item of furniture. You have two ones made out of solid wood. That's the real genuine article. And the other one is made out of some cheaper material, maybe chipboard. But they cover it. With the veneer. And often the, the, the furniture with the veneer looks better than the real deal. But it's not the real deal. It's showing something on the outside which it really isn't beyond the surface. So James is asserting here that there's a lifestyle that comes out of true, genuine faith that results in us as believers modifying our behavior. So if you've come to saving faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit now indwells you, there is going to be a progressive modification to your, to our behavior. You will not just continue to live as you lived before you became a Christian. And some of this is going to spill over into next week's message. So just to link this up to what we heard last week from Brother Philip Gray, he spoke about uh, the uncontrolled tongue. That no matter what veneer you have on the outside, if you cannot control your tongue, you are living out an empty religion. Amen. So if you can't hear something and zip it up, everything you hear, you have to chat. That's just a veneer. There needs to be a modification in our behavior. If all you can do is just criticize and the way you go up is by pulling others down with your tongue, you cannot control your tongue, that's empty religion. That's not genuine faith. That does not demonstrate the life of a believer who has a seed of desire in them to become more like Jesus Christ. The true religion is demonstrated in practical living and exemplified typically in pure speech, pure love, and pure character. 
And now we can pretend to be who we want to be. But you know what betrays us? When we look at how we deal with other people. The relationships we have with others will say really, if we have genuine faith and we're living that out, or if we're just living in pretense, and, or if we're just deceiving ourselves. So we will see in verses 1 to 13 of James 2, that if we have true saving faith, you will practice impartiality and see people in terms of character and not clothing. So this scripture is inviting us to not judge a book by its cover, as the saying goes, but to look a little deeper. It's entreating us to treat others the way the Lord has treated us. And we do that in the power of his spirit. Amen. So James 2 verse 1 says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. We live in a world that is obsessed with ranking things. This morning I saw in the news those who received awards for best actress and actor for Coronation Street and EastEnders. We, we, we like to rank things, put them in our perceived order, first, second, third, and so on. And you know that we can even do this in church. We can make distinctions amongst people and prefer those who we perceive to be more prestigious, who hold higher positions. But that's incompatible with the faith of our Lord, as this verse says, the Lord of glory, which excludes favoritism based on wealth or class. Let me just define the word partiality. Partiality means to judge according to the face. It means to pass judgment on partial knowledge. Partiality, you judge somebody on partial knowledge. In other words, not waiting for full information, but jumping to conclusions by what you initially see. So this is not just making a judgment based on someone that doesn't look like us, but it is judging who is valuable to God and who is not so valuable to God. And what James is saying, if we are representing Jesus Christ, who showed no partiality, we should do the same as Jesus. Amen? Let me just speak from a few examples of our Lord Jesus from the scripture. He was not partial. He commended the contribution of the widow at the temple over the large sums of money that the rich people gave. But he looked past the cover and he could see that she gave her best, her all, while others were giving out of their riches. Jesus spent time with a Samaritan woman. We know that the Jews and the Samaritans didn't have a great relationship. So he could have been partial, but to spend time with a Samaritan in public, a woman who had a bad reputation, meant that Jesus valued this woman. Jesus went to the home of the tax collector, Zacchaeus, for dinner. Everybody knew that Zacchaeus was a dishonest man. It would be the equivalent of maybe, say, a politician publicly announcing he was going to spend time and go to someone of ill repute in the neighborhood. 
Someone that everybody knows is up to no good. Can you imagine a politician going to spend time with such a person? That's what Jesus did. He also called a tax collector to be one of his followers. He touched the lepers, those who were scorned and outcasts. Jesus touched them and came in contact with them. He also called a group of commoners to be his disciples. He could have gone to the religious elite and called them, but he didn't. He chose a group of commoners that probably nobody would give a second thought to. Jesus said, blessed are the poor. And finally, we see in the book of Acts, Jesus calls an anti-Christian zealot by the name of Saul and made him one of the most prominent missionaries and the first theologian of the church and renamed him Paul. So we see from the example of Jesus, and there are many more, that he did not live out his life being partial to those that he met and we ought to follow his example. Verse 2 says, For if there come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there. Or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I'm not going to go there today, but you know, one of the contentious issues that we could debate is where people sit in church. <laughs> but I won't go there. But the scripture is saying, if someone comes in with fine clothing, or if you are a King James reader, it will say, in gay clothing. By the way, it means gay as, gay meant radiant, (laughs) white and bright clothing. In fact, in that time, the whiter your toga, your Roman toga was, it was a sign that you were wealthy. In other words, you didn't get your clothes dirty and you had uh, servants that could keep you looking white and spotless. So that's what the scripture is speaking of. Someone comes in in gay, in fine, white clothing. There's a temptation there to be partial and want to place that person in the best possible seating position in the assembly. Now James is not saying that all rich people are evil, so let's get that clear. And neither is he saying that all poor people are spiritual. But I believe the first point I really want to make is that James is saying when we treat people with partiality, we are hijacking God's authority and placing ourselves in the place of choosing who is valuable. Well, I want to let you know that we don't get a choice to choose. Whoever God sends to us, whoever God sends across our path, we don't have the option to choose. As Christians, we ought to exhibit love and impartiality and love whoever comes amongst us. There's a story of a woman who moved into a new town and she lived across a stream. There was a bridge that crossed the stream. And she she saw a church on the other side of the stream and she wanted to join the church. So she one day went across and said to the minister, I want to become a part of this church. The minister seemed to be discouraging her. So she left it and she came back a week or so after and said, um, you know, I really want to be a, com- a part of this church. So the minister said, yeah, tell you what, go away, think about it. 
and then come back. So she did. And then she met up with the minister again and she said, I've gone away, I've thought about it, I still want to be a part of this church. He said, I'm going to ask you to go away, read your Bible every day, pray, seek God and ask him if he really wants you to be a part of this church. So she went away and she did that. And the minister didn't see her for months. He began to wonder, what happened to that lady? And then one day he met her up in the town. And uh, he said, how come I haven't seen you for so long? She said, I went away, as you said, I've been praying, reading my Bible, asking God if he wants me to be a part of your church because it doesn't seem as if you want to let me in. But God says, don't worry about it. I've been trying to get in for the last 25 years, and I can't get in. (laughs) I hope we're not putting up any barricades for people who want to get into this church, or in fact, any church. Amen? God takes partiality very seriously. You can see this in verse 11 of James 2, where he equates it with adultery and murder. When we allow ourselves to treat people, when we show favoritism, because we believe they have influence or money, social status or their appearance, we are revealing something of our heart. We are revealing that there's something that is broken and something that needs fixing. And if we are honest with ourselves, when we show favoritism, it is rooted often in our desire to gain benefit for ourselves. It's based on selfish motivation. In other words, we show favor to people that we think in turn, will return favor to us. And sometimes those people don't even realize the reason why you're sweetening them up. Not so much because you like them, but you're trying to gain something for your selfish gain from them. So this is really calling for us to be honest Verse 5 says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? These verses has a the, the sting of irony in them. And I spoke about that in the previous message when I spoke from James 1, 9 through to 11. So I'm not going to go over that. But you know, Mark 10, 23 is a good reference to look at. Where Jesus says, you know, it's a difficult thing for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But we have to be careful here. This scripture is saying that we do not favor those who exploit us and might well be the enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we have to remember in this context that these believers were scattered. They had to flee for their lives from Jerusalem and most likely their persecutors would have been the rich people. Not likely they would have been the poor people. It would have been people of influence, uh, people of status, people who have authority, would have been their persecutors. So James is saying, just be mindful that when people come amongst you and you're showing favoritism to them, it could have been these very people who had a say in you being persecuted and fleeing from Jerusalem. So we have to be mindful of that too. 
Verse 8 says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. The point I want to make here is that partiality, or showing partiality, is breaking the law in the very same way that committing adultery or murder breaks the law in the court of heaven. We can deceive ourselves and we can say to ourselves, well, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't been unfaithful to my spouse. I haven't murdered anyone. Therefore, we draw a conclusion, I must be right in the sight of God. But James is saying, not so fast. God is holy. Let me put it this way. A bank robber in the court of law is on trial for breaking into the local Halifax bank. And in his defense, he says to the judge, Judge, I've never broken the speed limit. I don't sell drugs. I even found a lost credit card the other day and I handed it into the police. I paid my TV license. Have mercy, judge. (laughs) What do you think the judge is going to say? You're going down, son. But you did commit that bank robbery though, didn't you? What the scripture is saying, that if you break any part of the law, you've broken the law. So it's not to say, I am so righteous and I keep all these laws, but if you're being partial, treating people with partiality, you're still breaking the law. And the scripture says that this is sin, just as committing adultery, just as murder is sin. So let's not deceive ourselves and say that, You know, we're perfect and we're not in in the way that we practice our faith. We're in progress. We don't always execute the way we live our lives in the way that God would want us to. But we are in progress. But to say that, well, there's nothing wrong with me. It's them. It's not me. It's the others. That's false religion. The Spirit wants us to examine ourselves Today, and not just look at what we do, which we can say, well, this is good. But what are we omitting to do? Or what are we doing that's contrary to the law? Let's remember that the primary purpose of the law is to show us that we cannot keep the law. But Jesus came, the person who kept all the law perfectly. And he died for us who cannot keep the law. That's the gospel. So we need to be honest and come out from beneath the veneer. Expose our hearts and our ways to God and to the move of his spirit and his word. And say, God, you know me, you see me, change me. I want to become more like what you want me to be. Amen. Verse 12 says, so speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. I want to let you know this afternoon that there is coming a judgment. There is coming a day of judgment. If you name the name of Christ, If you're saved, in other words, you're born again. For you, that judgment is not going to be about whether you go to heaven or hell because that was dealt with 
on the day when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But the judgment that this scripture is speaking of is a judgment where our deeds, every deed that you as a believer has done will be judged before God. And it will determine your position in the coming kingdom of God. And we know from the scripture that some of our deeds, when tried in the fire, some of our deeds are going to be like hay. They're just going to be consumed by the fire. Only those deeds which are are done out of purity to honor God will withstand that judgment. And it will determine in the coming kingdom our position. The scripture tells us of the parable that when Jesus came, to some he said, I give you ten cities to rule over. Others he will say, I give you five. He may say to some one, and to some he may say, you will not be ruling over any cities. Wouldn't that be sad? So we, New Testament believers, will be judged by the law of liberty. Let me just try to explain this as best as I can. So prior to Christ, prior to Christ's advent, the book of Romans tells us that we were judged by the law of sin and death. But Romans 8 also tells us that in the fullness of time, Jesus came and bore the full weight of the law of sin and death on the cross. So we who are saved, as the scripture says, we're no longer under the law, we're under grace now. So we won't be judged if you're a believer by the law of sin and death. But the law of liberty means that in loving God, that we should not love God because we're, we should reverence him, obviously, but not because we're afraid of the consequences of the law, but we should love God because we just love him. The example comes to mind, if you can think of somebody in your life who has been a real tower of strength, they've been a rock for you, they've been there with you through thick and thin, always seems to be there to pick you up, and you perhaps wonder, is there, is there going to come a time when I will be able to do something for this person? And that time comes when that individual says to you, can I ask a favor of you? And of course, your heart will be so glad that this person who has stood alongside me through thick and thin, held my hand, never judged me, condemned me, is now asking me for a favor. Of course, gladly, you would want to offer yourself and do that favor with all your heart. Well, it's the same sort of thing uh, with God who has forgiven us of our many sins. And there's another parable in the scripture where there is a king who has a servant who owes him a lot of money. Jesus said when the king was checking his books, he found his servant owed him, in today's terms, millions of pounds, we could say. And he calls him in to say, you know, I want my money. And if you don't provide the money, I'm going to sell your house, your land, everything. Servant falls to his knees and says to the king, oh king, please be patient with me. Give me another chance. And the king says, I'll have mercy on you. I will wipe out your debt. Can you imagine the joy in the heart of that servant? But then the same servant goes out into the market and sees somebody that owes him a few hundred pounds. I think the scripture said he grabs him (laughs) and says to him, give me my money, I want it now. And there before that servant, this friend falls on his knees and does exactly what the servant did to the king. He says, please. Give me a chance to gather this money together. 
The servant doesn't show any mercy or compassion. He has the friend thrown into prison. But you know there's a God. So when the king finds out what the servant had done, how he had pardoned him, and because this man owed him a few hundred pounds, he had him thrown into prison. He calls him wicked. Not wicked as in good. Wicked as in wicked. Evil. Brethren, let me just say that, you know, when we treat people with partiality, we're being like that servant. We forget our sins, our shortcomings, our wrongdoings. And that God has forgiven us of that, those masses of missing the mark and sin and failings. But yet we will look at somebody else who has a fault maybe similar to us or maybe not even as bad as we were. And we're ready to condemn, we're ready to pull them down. We need to remember that we have been forgiven much. Before we judge others, before we are partial, we have to keep in mind that we have been forgiven of much. As God has forgiven us, you know, the scripture says that love covers a multitude of sin. So you don't have to press that point so hard with that individual. Let love cover faults and failings. You don't have to criticize. You don't have to phone up somebody and say, did he see what so-and-so did? Really, you don't have to do that. I'm telling you, you don't have to. You might have the itch or the urge to do that. You don't have to do that. Let love cover a multitude of sins, of faults, of shortcomings. Keeping the law of God means that we should value everyone and treat everyone with the same respect. That sounds a lot easier than it actually is because we all have our biases and prejudices and and preferences, but this is the goal. This is a target. And they, if you are a believer, there must be something in you, if you are alive in Christ, that's pulling you towards living in this way. Amen. So I'm speaking to myself. I'm speaking to all of us here. If you're alive in the Spirit, there must be a seed in you that's saying, God, I fall short of this. I do treat people with partiality. I do judge people by what I initially see of them without the full facts. But help me today to move towards that goal where I don't do that anymore. And I actually value those that you have created with equal value. Amen. Verse 13 says, For judgment is without mercy. To the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I believe this scripture is not just speaking about the principle about what you sow, you will reap. Although I believe it includes that. In other words, if you don't show mercy, no mercy will be shown to you. In the context, if you understand God's mercy... And his forgiveness towards you as a believer. Then you will forgive. You will treat people with respect. And value them. If you don't. You know what this scripture is saying? In the context. It's literally saying if you don't. You are not a Christian. You just have the veneer. Of a Christian on the outside, but you're, you're not a person of genuine faith. 
Because if you are changed, if you are regenerated, if you are transformed, and if you have a seed in you that's saying, God, I'm not where you want me to be, but I want to get to that goal where I love, where I forgive, where I respect, where I value. If that's not in you, then I'd have to question, are you really saved? Or do you just have the words, you know how to raise your hands, you know all the songs, and so on. This, this is heavy, isn't it? Where's my amen corner? <laughs> I told you at the beginning of this year, I'm going to preach the Bible this year. And under God, I'm not joking. Because if we are going to reach this world, people have to come in here and see the genuine articles. Because believe you me, someone who's not a Christian can spot a fake a mile off. It's not about what we say. It's not about what we purport or what we pretend to be. But I said, you know, the test of who we are is challenged with our relationships. So don't tell me you love me and then walk past me at the end of church. Are you saved? That's what James is saying. Are you really and truly converted? Or do you just have a form of godliness? If we understand the mercy of God and how much He has released us from our debt of sin, we live in the light of that. We'll be more prone or lean towards forgiving others no matter what wrong they've done to us church we need to grow in the grace of God and demonstrate to others the mercy that we have received from God I have good news if you're not a Christian Verse 13 says that mercy triumphs over judgment. There's a chance for you to know Jesus Christ and to receive full forgiveness of your sins and live in the way that he lived. Loving from a pure heart, forgiving, not showing partiality, and valuing everybody and respecting everyone. The story of Charlotte Elliott of Brighton, England, a young person, lived a carefree life, gaining popularity as a portrait artist and writer of humorous verse. By the time she was 30, however, her health began to fail rapidly, and soon she became a bedridden, embittered invalid. Her health was broken, And her disability had hardened her. She said, if God loved me, he would not have treated me this way. Hoping to help her, a Swiss minister, Dr. Caesar Milan, visited the Elliots on May the 9th, 1822. Over dinner, Charlotte lost her temper and railed against God and family in a violent outburst. Her embarrassed family left the room and Dr. Milan was left alone with her. He said to her, you are tired of yourself, aren't you? He asked. You are holding to your hate and anger because you have nothing else in the world to cling to. Consequently, you have become sour, bitter and resentful. What is the cure, asked Charlotte? The faith you are trying to despise. As they talked, Charlotte softened. If I wanted to become a Christian and to share the peace and joy you possess, she finally asked, what would I do? He replied, you would give yourself to God just as 
you are now. With your fightings and fears, hates and loves, pride and shame. I would come to God just as I am. Is that right? Charlotte did come just as she was. Her heart was changed that day. As time passed, she found and claimed John 6.37 as a special verse for her. He who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. At a later date, Charlotte Elliott sat down and while sitting there wrote the words of what we know as a favorite hymn. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. And then the final stanza says, Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. I think it's needless to say that all of us in here are guilty of treating at some point, sometime, somebody with partiality. If you're honest, you would admit to that. I want our prayer as we close this service to be, God help me to value everybody, not just them by their social standing, status, their appearance, their wealth, their education, but to respect and value your creation. Amen? I want to appeal to anybody in here who you may be broken. You may feel that people haven't valued you. People have disrespected you. I'm here to tell you that you are valuable in the eyes of God. I, as a pastor of this church, I value you. And as a church, we value you. If you want us to pray for you because you feel broken because of life circumstances, this altar is open. We're not going to ask you of any details unless you want to share. But this altar is open if you want to come and just allow God by his spirit to restore your value, your self-esteem today. I believe that this is an opportune time and God will do that. As we're praying, I want to say to the household of faith, to those who are believers, let's allow God's word, let's look into it as a mirror. Let's see ourselves, let's see our shortcomings. Let's just not just say, everything's A-OK, everything's right with me, because I haven't done this, that, the other. But have we been partial? Have we treated people, undervalued them? Have we hijacked God's authority to set someone up above another. We've all done it at, at, at some point. I know we have. But let's be honest before God and say, God, that message that pastor's preached today, uh, didn't really like it. Pinching me in places that's hurting. Well, you know, it's doing the same for me. Because the, the, the person who brings the word, I've got to turn it back and look at myself in the mirror also. But as I said, that's a good sign. That spiritually you are alive. Amen. Can we stand together? The altar is open. If you are a believer and you want prayer or help in this area, then as the song says, just as I am, just come as you are. God has grace and mercy to deal with our shortcomings, our faults and our failings. 
Amen. Okay, can we just sing the verse that's up on the screen there, please? Just as I am. God our Father, today we look into the mirror of your word. We open our hearts to you, O God. Thank you for saving those of us who are saved. Thank you for the work of regeneration and transforming our hearts and minds. Lord, our desire is to live in a manner that's pleasing to you, and we don't always get that right. We're not perfect. We acknowledge today that we are works in progress. So often when your word is taught or preached, Lord, we say that word would be so good for somebody else and fail to look at ourselves. But today I ask, Spirit of God, that you will search our hearts. There may be many things that we are doing which are right, which are correct, which are just, which are righteous. But Lord, none of us would dare cast the stone. He that has no sin, none of us would dare to cast the stone. Because we know we have our shortcomings and our failures. Even though we're saved, even though we're on our way to heaven. Lord, we don't want to ignore those things today. We ask you, oh God, help us Lord, stirring us a seed of desire to be more like Jesus. Lord, may we not just be content with living out a false, a veneer type of lifestyle. You're calling us, oh God, to a place of genuineness. A place where people can touch and handle and see love coming from a place of pure motivation God I ask that by your spirit you will propel us towards this goal because this is the way that we are going to reach out and win the loss to you when they see your empathy and compassion flowing out of us spirit of God some of us are stuck in a rut we're so used to ourselves and our ways and the way we are that we've lost the desire to change well I pray that that will be broken today in the name of Jesus that you will aliven us in our conscience oh God in the name of Jesus that we will see ourselves before you that are areas in our lives that are broken and need to be fixed will not resist the move of your spirit because I know your presence is here touching our hearts and lives it doesn't always come out in an emotional outburst but it doesn't mean that you're not doing a real meaningful deep work in our lives and I believe that's what's happening right now in this place oh God Help us to cultivate a healthy respect and value for every human being. The word says that we should prefer others before ourselves. We should not exalt ourselves. He said, you have shown us, oh man, what is good and what is required of thee, but to love mercy. To walk humbly with you, O oh God. So help us, Lord. Become just as we are and believe, Lord, that today you are doing a deep work in our hearts. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus. Let's lift our hands and just 
be thankful to God that he loves us so much he has forgiven us of our sins and released us from our debts and our transgressions because we acknowledge that today he has called us to live in the same manner on this earth and demonstrate that in our relationships can we give God praise hallelujah